Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Making Sense webinar this evening. It is May 11th, and I'm excited to have you here with us tonight. My name is Hillary Hunt. I serve as director of the Making Sense Project. And uh, I've got a couple of things to go over before we dive into our main content for the evening. So to begin, uh, we will have a handout, or we have a handout that's prepared with a ton of different links and some additional information. That in, uh, link is going out to you in a moment in the chat from uh, Kevin Curry at Penn State. So look for that. He'll share it a couple of times throughout the webinar in case you're looking for that. Um, we're going to have uh, three pages. It has lots of different links to all of the games we're going to talk about, as well as some of the videos I'll play and other related links that I think might make for um, good follow-up information for you to walk away from tonight's session with. Um, as we get started, I would love it if everybody would take a moment to use the chat area and introduce themselves. Uh, your name, where you're from, uh, so what district and county you teach in, uh, grade level, subject area, and you know what is your interest in financial education? Do you teach a course? Is it embedded or integrated with what you do? Maybe you're a guidance counselor um, and you incorporate financial education into your career education and, and work um, efforts. You know, just give us a little bit of background on uh, where you're coming from with this. So appreciate it very much. And if you don't mind when you send it, use that little um, drop down that says all panelists and attendees. Um, that way everybody can see um, everybody else who's in our virtual room here um, since we're using the webinar feature instead of the meeting feature. With that, just a little bit of background. Um, we always have a few folks on that have not participated in one of our webinars before, so I wanna make sure everybody is aware that this is an effort of the Making Sense Project, which is a partnership between the Pennsylvania Department of Education and Penn State University. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Kevin Curry on with us from Penn State, who is our uh, wonderful partner there. And uh, this is part of an overall series of financial education and economic initiatives. You can always go to our website at makingsensepa.org to learn more about some of the other things that we offer. Uh, our webinars, we always try and do one of three things or sometimes more than one, but on this one, we're focused on this center pillar of highlighting different resources for you to teach financial literacy or personal finance. Um, these aren't necessarily in every case tonight um, designed to teach personal finance, but they're all, uh, all can be used for that. So uh, it should be a little bit of an interesting take on things tonight. And so with that, let's kick off with the main content for this evening, which is uh, we're going to follow our popular 6 and 60 format, which means that I have 60 minutes, or what's remaining from that, to get through six different board and card games that you can use in your classroom to enhance financial education. We are gonna start off with this list. So this is a list of some of the games that we are going to talk about. And I wanna launch this poll and ask everybody to vote. So which, if any of these games, have you used in your classroom? So this is a multiple choice question. You can pick more than one. Um, you should be able to pick more than one. Uh, which of these have you used before? Cover your assets, pit, can't stop, act your wage, monopoly, the newer versions, um, and life, the newer versions. And it's okay if you just pick monopoly and life because you know them and love them and you've played them for a long, long time. So take a second and find that poll. All right, so so far I haven't seen anybody that is or has used the first four, so that's great. Looks like those are gonna be new to folks this evening. Uh, so that's awesome. So some of the other ones you might be familiar with the games, but maybe you haven't used them in your classroom. So let me go ahead and end that poll. I appreciate you for giving me, appreciate that you gave me that information. So where did this idea about this session come, come from? Well, um, I've always been a fan of using games in classrooms. I think it adds uh, to the excitement and some of the things that you're doing in class. It can be used to reward students. It can be used sometimes when you need a little bit of filler or downtime. 
Um, but ideally, it should also connect to the curriculum, right? And so I have uh, participate in a uh, um, Facebook group that is sponsored by or um, started by Next Gen Personal Finance called Finlit Fanatics. And this concept of games and games and personal finance classes has been um, a topic that's gotten a lot of interest from folks. And uh, these two stacks of games were actually shared by one of the teachers who's in that group. She's a teacher from um, up in New England, uh, Jackie Prester, who I've had a chance to work with on a few things um, nationally. She's great. Um, and she actually um, managed to get all of these games with a Donors Choose grant and uses them in a variety of different um, formats. Uh, at least a lot of these she, she purchased with a Donors Choose grant. She's a business ed teacher, so she teaches a couple of different things. Um, but she also was talking about how uh, she has used some of these sometimes when she has, she teaches multitudes of grades in one classroom. And so sometimes some students are pulled for testing and other things that are going on. Like if she doesn't have all of her students there that she sometimes uses these um, in that environment when she doesn't want to get some students to get ahead and, and others. So this sort of piqued my interest. Um, and I've always had kind of this interest about how you can use certain games to teach personal finance. Um, and then my confession to you all is that I am a sucker for a game um, in this current environment. Lots of us are playing games. That's something that my family uses all the time. Lots of us are also cleaning out closets. So this is my now well-organized for now game closet, um, which uh, struck me that I probably need a 12-step program. First thing saying that I um, have a problem here. Um, obviously, we have more games than we know what to do with. And this is believe it or not, after actually purging quite a few um, that we are um, have given some to some other families, in particular those with, with younger kids. So um, anybody else out there, a, a, a game fanatic, let me know over in the chat. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier um, when I was asking folks to introduce themselves, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of incentive this evening for folks to be engaged in the chat. Um, so if you are adding valuable comments, asking great questions, what have you, I'm going to keep track of those and um, pick a couple people from each session um, to reach out to you afterwards and offer to um, send them one or more of the games that we um, talk about on the webinar tonight. So just a little encouragement to uh, get engaged and follow along over there in, in the chat and or in the Q&A. So, all right, so this is my game closet. Um, you can see I have a whole stack here that has some of the ones that we're going to talk about in it, along with some others that are pretty popular. Um, so I've gotten a chance to to play them, use them with my own kids, and, uh, you know, it, it's always it's always fun. So anyhow, these are just some of our favorites. Or, well, all of our favorites are in here because this is now all of our games. Um, so how do you fund this? Well, some people look at that you know pile of games and think, Hillary, you've spent a fortune. And in some cases, we have because um, you know some of these we tend to get like, a game for each of our kids for for their birthday or for Christmas. They usually get one game. But a lot of these in this stack, actually, believe it or not. Um, have come from thrift stores. So if you are ever um, at a thrift shop, and I dare say if anybody, I think, you know, everybody's been doing a whole lot of cleaning out with everything that's going on. Um, my guess is that the thrift stores are going to be overrun with things when things reopen. It's going to be a great time when you're ready um, and willing to get out to go and explore and pick up games at thrift shops. You never know what you're going to find. Yes, you might be missing a piece or two, but um, a lot of times, I, every one of the ones that I've ever bought um, from a thrift shop has come with all the pieces. Um, but some other places where you can go and get um, funding, donors choose, like I mentioned with what um, Jackie Prester did, you can go on and submit a project there. There are a bunch of different ones that have been funded for financial literacy games. And so, you know, go and search some of those, see what they wrote up and see what you can do to get funding to purchase maybe a class set of a game or maybe purchase a couple of different games um, sort of as a evaluation copies to see whether you think that they work in your classroom. Um, if you're in a CTE um, program and you have any Perkins funds that need to be used here, especially at the end of the year, um, maybe especially if you have money that didn't get used because you're out of school, um, that might be another possibility for some funding. And never hesitate to ask and see if um, folks might donate or lend them to you. So for example, you might have 
if you want to do, um, if you want, you know, want to use one of these, you know, say like Monopoly games, lots of people have Monopoly in their closet or the game of life, you know, ask students to bring them in or see if any families have any of these games and would be willing to donate them to you. Or maybe a local business or a credit union, for example, might be willing to, um, you know, sponsor the purchase of these to be used in your classroom. So just a few ideas um, on how you might be able to accumulate some of these. If you pick some of these up now, um, some of the prices, I'm going to share with you some of the prices on these. Some of them, I've seen them going up a little bit. I think that's a supply and demand issue. Um, so keep an eye on those. But, um, you know, maybe you want to, if you've got, you know, kids at home yourself, uh, you know, maybe you want to uh, get some of these and play them at home with your family uh, and uh, use your time well uh, as we're all sitting at home a lot more than usual. So today uh, we're gonna kick off with Cover Your Assets. Cover Your Assets is fun. I, one of the reasons I like it is because it is uh, um, brought to us by a small um, uh, uh, sort of family-owned business. This is from Grandpa, Peck, uh, Grandpa Beck's Games. Um, and it is a card game. Um, it comes in a smallish box, um, so it doesn't take up a whole lot of space on a closet, but in a closet, especially if you want to get a number of um, sets of this to use in your classroom. And you're able to use this with quite a few students at a time. It'll take about 30 minutes to play. And you can cover assets, risk management, and investing are good uh, tie-ins to the curriculum. So let's take a look at how you play Cover Your Assets. Introducing Grandpa Beck's Cover Your Assets, a Beck family favorite. The goal of Cover Your Assets is to become the first millionaire. The cards represent valuable assets, as well as gold and silver, which are wild cards. Players build their own stack of assets by making pairs. You can make a pair with two matching cards, or any asset card and a wild card. Now here's where the gameplay gets intense. You don't just make pairs yourself, you can just steal them from other players. Oh, I like that. Want that guy's classic autos? Yeah, I do. Show him a classic auto or wild card from your hand, and try and steal them. He's not defenseless though. He can defend with a matching card or a wild card. Now you may be able to make a second attempt to steal those same assets. The defender can choose to battle back, or to save his cards for later. The winner takes all. That includes the classic autos on top of the pile. Plus, all the cards you use to challenge or defend. Now that set is worth a whole lot more. You betcha. You're going to want to cover those classic autos soon, because now everyone is going to want to steal them. Unfortunately for you, you can't cover them up until your next turn. Yeah, good luck with that. Uh-oh. Keep playing and building your assets until everyone runs out of cards. Add up your cards at the end of the round and play again until someone has a million dollars in assets. I'm a winner! That's Grandpa Bex Cover Your Assets. Cover yours, steal theirs. First millionaire wins. Right. So in that game, in this game, um, one of the things I look for in games are things that are not just luck. I look for things that have to have some type of um, strategy. So um, some strategic decisions are whether or not you know you play a pair um, or if you're going to hold on to those and use them to try and steal from somebody else's. Um, do you want to use your wild card? Um, and or how do you want to use that? So those are some different things that, you know, um, play into your decision making. So definitely a lot of decision making goes on during this game. Um, afterwards, here are a few questions that I came up with as things that you might be able to pose to students. Um, either having a classroom discussion or maybe having them respond um, individual and uh, individually. So um, you know, thinking about, you know, what are real life assets, for example, and how would you protect those? Um, does it pay in the game to diversify your assets or is it better to sort of uh, hoard or collect uh, more of the same? Um, there's this whole notion of amassing a net worth of a million dollars. That's how you win. So is that a realistic goal? Um, I think this would be a great conversation or even, you know, you could play this in the context of uh, goal setting, uh, financial goal setting in particular, and maybe even how that plays into your um, to your uh, values. So, you know, maybe that's something that you really want to do. Maybe that's something that you don't care quite as much about. Um, and then, you know, different things about, you know, asset values. And then this last question, um, how would you improve the game? And that's always something that I think is great um, as a debrief for any game that you play. You know, what could you do to change that up? Um, so it is, 
um, you know, really, I think, you know, a, a great way to get them sort of thinking in a more advanced, in a more advanced way about what they just did. Um, game creation is also something that I think is incredibly value and gets, you know, really promotes those higher level um, thinking skills. Some other follow-up that you could have students do, uh, for example, how is net worth calculated and what is the average net worth of American families? So how does it vary by age, region, um, or another factor? So lots of different things that you can do there as a spin-off of the topics in this uh, game. When it comes to, um, I see some different comments here. Um, so yes, this would be great for an accounting class also, absolutely. Um, and there was a question too about that picture. Uh, let me run back to it real quick. Um, the picture from the closet uh, or the shelves in uh, the teacher's classroom. So uh, this um, bears and bulls, charge large, payday, logo. Um, those are ones that we're not gonna talk about that. And um, let's see, um, I think I saw Thrive. Oh, the cash flow one over here. Um, some of these we're not talking about today. They're actually on my list of ones um, to see if people will be interested in for others. Some of these are really hard to get your hands on right now um, or harder or more expensive. So I didn't include those on this one. Um, and then some of these are not necessarily business oriented um, or intended to be business oriented, but you could try and figure out ways to do it. Like Catan is really a great one in terms of resource allocation. Um, there are other games like that, like um, Machi Koro would be another one that has sort of some corollary lessons that could definitely be applied to personal finance, but aren't necessarily um, intended for that. Um, so uh, great question there um, from Renee. Okay, so our second game is on PIT. So PIT um, is gonna cost uh, between nine and $15, depending on which one, um, which version of this you purchase. And this is one of those where I think it's better when you play it with more people. So um, the more folks that you can have, the better. And this one, um, is a pretty quick one. Uh, it's been around since 1903. At least that's what Wikipedia said, but now that I like dig in on the front of this box, it says 1904. So um, maybe there's a, you know, I should, maybe I shouldn't trust Wikipedia um, or wherever I got that one from the other day, but it's been around for a long time. This game has been around. Um, so again, this is another one that you can pick up like at thrift shops because you might find some older ones. Um, and there's a lot of connections here between risk, um, investing in the stock market and commodities. We'll come back to some of these in a few minutes. So three different versions. Um, there's just the plain old card game version. This one comes in a box kind of like you would find Uno. Um, there are, uh, this del there's this deluxe version that has a bell. So instead of the pit corner um, card, you get a bell. Or in the brand new, very exciting Amazon exclusive, it is all new colors um, and, uh, a full do, I guess, electronic version of the bell. I haven't um, played that one. I have the deluxe one with the bell um, here, and that's our, our family favorite. Um, but, you know, lots of different versions here. Um, I honestly think that you could probably make your own um, version of Pit if you wanted to. Um, that might be another sort of fun and intriguing um, way to get students involved. You could possibly do it so that it would have, if you made your own cards, for example, you could um, have different commodities, maybe more commodities so that you could have more students even play. Um, so there, there could be a way to, to expand upon that. Um, so let's take a look at how this one is played. Pit, how to play. The object of the game is to be the first player to score 500 points by making sets of nine cards. Setup, place the corner board on the table in reach of all the players. Sort the deck so that a complete set of nine identical cards is included for each player playing and shuffle them together. It doesn't matter which suits you pick. For example, if you are playing with five players, you would shuffle five sets of nine cards together. Deal nine cards face down to each player. Each player looks at their own cards but keeps them hidden from their opponents. Once everyone is ready, the dealer says, the exchange is open. Every player now plays simultaneously by trading the same quantity of cards with other players. To trade, take up to four cards of the same suit and call out the total number of cards. 
You may trade with any other player so long as the quantity of cards match. You may negotiate a trade of fewer cards with an opponent by simply removing cards from your initial trade. While trading, keep the faces of your cards hidden from other players. Continue trading until one player corners the market and has all nine cards of the same suit and hits the corner board calling out, corner on cattle, or whatever the commodity might be. The first player to corner a market scores points equal to the number indicated on the commodity they cornered. Add these points to the scores on the piece of paper and if no one surpasses 500 points, then the winner shuffles and deals the next hand. The first player to 500 points wins. Pit. So that was sort of the introductory version of how to play this game. Um, and that is exactly how I would have students play it the first couple of rounds. Um, thank you for those of you who chimed in and said you remember playing this when you were younger um, with your family or with a neighborhood game. Um, it was a favorite. Yeah, this is a great one. And um, I think it's a lot of fun. I think um, there's a lot of different ways that you could set this up in a classroom, depending on how you wanted to do it. So um, I would start with just this introductory version of the game. Um, you could later add in what are called as a bear and a bull card, which sort of add a little bit of um, a little bit more complexity to the game. Another thing that you can do is um, you can choose whether or not students are going to um, verbalize their offers like two, 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 four, 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 you know, what have you for the number of cards, or if they just can hold up that number of cards with that number of fingers. You can see what the difference is between a silent trade and a, um, a verbal trade. So that can also be kind of interesting to compare and contrast. Um, I think it's interesting if you had one set, for example, you could have one group of students um, play with um, a sort of diversified set of values. So maybe they have the highest and the lowest and two in the middle. Maybe other um, another group plays with um, commodities that all have a very similar value and see if that changes the dynamics of the game. So there's lots of different things that you can do. Another thought I've had is if you only had one set of the game, um, you might be able to play it or might want to play it sort of in a fishbowl type of environment. So have one group of students come to the center of the room, everybody else can gather around and watch how they play. Um, you might even have somebody that stands behind other players and maybe then could critique what they did and say, you know, I think if I had been playing, I would have made a different decision or I might have had a different strategy. So there's different ways that you can handle this depending on what resources you have and the number of students that you're dealing with. Um, as with the other um, game, I have some questions here. These are actually compliments of Take Charge Today. Um, we did a webinar with them earlier this year and they have a um, just set of discussion questions. So these are modified from, from that from their website and that is linked on your handout. But you know, how did you decide what commodity to corner? Was it easier to trade um, with other plays, players? Why or why not? Uh, did you end up corner, trying to corner the same commodity at the beginning, at the end as you tried to in the beginning? Why or why not? What kind of strategy was used? So for example, um, I often take the strategy of trying to get the lowest value one because I find sometimes that people are trying to trade the higher val um, uh, value ones and it takes them longer because more people are trying to do it. So if I focus on the lower, like sort of the low hanging fruit, um, I can win more rounds at a lower point value, um, but that's just my strategy. So everybody has a different strategy. Um, and so it can be really, you know, sort of interesting. So again, an element of luck, but definitely an, an element of strategy and what's otherwise a pretty simple game. So, you know, talking about demand, um, so that goes to that notion of the highest or the lowest value cards, for example, when you introduce the bull and the bear, how does that change things? If you tried silent, how does that different from being out loud? Um, and then again, you know, what did you learn? How might you change it? Um, you know, what did you like? What didn't you like? Um, I've included on the handout some additional resources. This is an entire lesson plan from the Wall Street Journal that revolves around um, playing pit. This, in this case, you play um, three basic rounds. Um, traditionally, the way that you win is by somebody getting 500 points. That would take a lot longer um, to do. So you, know, you might wanna adjust this depending on the amount of time that you're planning to dedicate to this in the classroom. You might have a, a different version of who wins. Um, I think it would be very interesting to discuss this in the context of how the stock exchanges work, or at least how many of them started. 
Um, interestingly enough, right now with the global pandemic, the New York Stock Exchange has um, closed the floor and has been a lot operating electronically. You know, lots of speculation about what the long-term impact of that is going to be, but, you know, be fascinating to have students, you know, watch videos of what it looks like on the floor or how that's changed over time. Um, so that is, you know, really sort of sort of an interesting take on things um, and certainly could be tied very much to uh, current events. Um, in this, uh, you know, in the game, you're not trading stocks, you're trading commodities. So, you know, what are commodities and what are futures, for example? And, um, you know, that's very important, especially, you know, say in the world of agriculture and what have you. So, um, this is a resource and this is um, found on one of the websites that I shared with you there called Futures Fundamentals. Um, this along with Econ Essentials is um, offered by, um, it's called the CME Group, which is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in cooperation with Discovery Education. So this is um, the facts behind food prices and what might um, impact whether or not people would want to trade um, uh, you know, corn, for example, as a commodity. So uh, it, lots of different things that you could really um, take and use and explore either, you know, using this sort of as a bouncing off place, if you will. So uh, I, I just, I just kind of love this one. Okay, our next one is called Can't Stop. Now, this is a game that if you participated in one of our webinars um, a while back, I sort of queued up and uh, mentioned this is, um, uh, so there's a number of games around that are kind of uh, vintage e, if you will. Um, and so the version of this that I actually first played was one of the original ones. It's in the game closet up at my in-laws uh, and happens to be one of my husband's favorite games. Um, it is uh, a great uh, game for telling the difference between individuals and their personalities. <laughs> um, it really shows the difference between our uh, sort of tolerance for risk and how we approach risk. Uh, and so again, this is one of those games there where strategy is, um, you know, it's equal part strategy and, and luck. So here's what happens in this game. Everybody um, has a color. So um, let's say, for example, in this game, it is my turn and I am blue. So when you, it's your turn, you get to roll four dice and you make um, two pairs. So in this case, this person I have selected, let's say, um, to make a six and to make a nine. That means I'm going to progress and move up the column in the six column and the nine column. So I've already gotten on the board in six and nine. I've already gotten one six in the past and one nine in the past. And now this little white cone is showing my progress. So this is at least my second or third turn. Um, and then I have the choice. So I now have um, used all three of the white cones, which is all you're allowed. You're allowed to make progress in three columns on your turn. So I have a choice right now. If I want to take my progress, so move my blue up to where the white um, placeholder cones are, or if I just can't stop rolling, I'm going to continue to press my luck and roll again. And so what's interesting about this game is you notice that if I was trying to roll twos, I don't have to get nearly as far to get that column and win that column. You win the column by going all the way up to the top and landing on that number. This is, you know, a lot harder to get twos because you have to get a one and a one, right? Two out of your four die need to be ones. It is a lot easier because there's many more combinations to make a seven or even a six or an eight or a nine or five. So in this case, my uh, attempts, I've got my, my uh, progress markers on the five, the six, and the nine columns. So I'm curious. Raise your hand if you would continue rolling, all right? Don't raise your hand if you would stop, all right? So the question is, are, are you one of those who can't stop? You keep rolling, all right? So we're getting a variety of answers, right? So this is about your risk tolerance. Some people, some adults, some kids, some people are gonna answer this very differently. A lot of this, and one of the reasons I love this, is it has to do with probability. So some of you know that I started out my career as a math educator. 
So I love this notion, you know, that, you know, it's a lot easier, you know, more of your roles, you're, you have know, a greater chance of, say, getting, you know, that five, six, or nine, which are the columns that I'm on, than you would a two or a 12, but it is also very easy to not get one of those. And then if you, let's say I rolled, uh, let's say I rolled two ones and uh, two threes, okay? So the only things I can get, um, well, in that case, I'd get a six, bad example. Let's say I rolled a combination <laughs> or four dice in which I can't find a five, a six, or a nine, okay? Um, in that case, uh, let's say I got two sixes and two ones, right? So I could either make two or 12 or sevens, all right? Um, then I am out. I'm out of luck because that none of those are numbers where I have my, my ones. So I'm out. I don't get to keep any of this progress. The white uh, cones get passed to the next person and my blue cones stay exactly where they are. If I were to roll a five, a six, or a nine, then I could continue to make progress. And at the point that I decide to stop rolling, then my blue markers would move up and um, be the end of my turn. So it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy this one. Um, and like I said, it, it is really fascinating the difference in strategy um, that people can take either between games, throughout the game, or if they're just, you know, their own personal um, risk tolerance shows through all the time. Um, my kids love playing this because if you goad my husband enough, um, he will almost always uh, roll the dice again, and they love it when he, you know, uh, can't move then. So, yeah, again, a really fun game to play. Um, this is one of the more expensive ones right now, and so um, I wanted to provide some alternatives. Now, uh, you know, you, I guess, have your own um, questions about, you know, whether or not this is okay or not, but there are some um, PDFs available um, where you can just print a board game, so you don't necessarily need to uh, invest in the actual board game if you think that might break your budget. Um, you would need to print different copies or make your own versions. There's a couple ones um, on the um, the website board game geek, uh, geek that I linked to under their files section for this game. Um, if you go through and scroll through, you'll find these and, and a number of other ones. There's a cute one like with a mountain and some others. Um, so anyhow, you would have to figure out what your markers are going to be. So you might use some pieces from some other games or you might use things like coins or, you know, um, maybe some um, pieces of candy, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, but you could certainly make this your own on a very um, very, very low budget um, option as well. Uh, again, different strategic decisions that you're making. Do you go, you know, keep rolling? Do you not? Um, you know, at the very beginning, especially, it's which number choices or number combinations are you going to choose? You know, obviously with four dice, you can combine them in different ways. What's going to influence you? You know, say, for example, nobody else is in that column and you want to sort of, you know, tackle sort of that, that white space or that open space, you know, lots of different factors that you can consider when you're um, playing the game. It's not as simple as it looks. Um, and then again, some post-game questions that you could pose to students. Um, I like some of the questions that talk about how you felt about this. So like, how did you feel about the risk that you, you know, you were taking as you were playing? Were you comfortable with it? Did it make you start to get a little nervous? Like, were you really questioning it? Or was there no question at all that you were going to keep rolling? You know, those are the kinds of things that I think that get to a person's personality and help them to sort of, you know, in a very non-threatening environment, take a look at how they feel about risk in general. And, you know, then, you know, so what role does that play in finances? Well, you know, let's look at right now. You know, there's a lot of people who probably thought, ah, what bad's going to happen? I'll be okay if I don't have an emergency savings. You know, probably none of us ever, you know, imagined a global pandemic in which people would need, you know, months and months worth of, um, of you know, income, you know, even though the financial gurus have told lots of people for a long time that you should have six months in the bank, right? Um, you know, lots of people have you know, considered themselves to be, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, the, you know, untouchable. That'll never happen to me. Um, or maybe they're just willing to take that risk. They're willing to take that grant gamble. Um, same thing with insurance. Are you willing to take the gamble or do you purchase the, in, in, the insurance when it comes to investing? How much, risk, uh, how much risk are you willing to take? 
And you know, what's the difference between that risk versus the reward? It takes more risk to go in, um, try and tackle the twos and the 12 column, for example, because those are a much lower chance that you're going to get them, but you also don't have to do it nearly as many times. So the return, you, you can win that column a lot faster if you go those pre, uh, the, on those columns, but it's a lot riskier as well. So a lot of different things that you could do to debrief this game. And again, you know, it's not intended for this. Obviously it's intended for a game just to have fun. Um, and a lot of people would look at it and never think of a connection between finances, but um, you know, you guys are stuck with me and I think about it, that sort of stuff all the time. So, um, anyhow, so there are some other options. Um, if you'd like to play a version of this and try it out, um, there is a link there to playing this on Board Game Arena where um, you can choose to just play as a guest if you want. Um, word of caution, if you're gonna have students play this, um, there is an ability to chat at the table. So you wanna be careful um, having students join in with strangers. But this is a great way for you as a teacher to play a number of rounds and decide um, you know, what you think about it against some virtual players. So when you go in, you can just play the simple game, select a speed where you play in real time, or if you'll be notified you know, when somebody else has played, I like doing it in real time. Sometimes it can take them you know, five, 10 minutes to find other people that are interested in playing. Um, and then do you want to play with people that you know or let them pick? So, um, you know, if you aren't signed in, don't have, you know, quote unquote friends on this website, um, the what is the website? Great question. So it is um, Board Game Arena and this should be linked on the handout, um, which uh, Kevin sent a link out earlier. Um, so this is under Can't Stop. Uh, they have other games too, so if you're into playing different games, um, some of them, however, are premium, so you have to pay to play King Domino, which is another family favorite of ours, or for sale, but um, there's a lot of different games on this website, and um, a, a great opportunity to explore games that you haven't played before and, and kind of think about them. Um, so as I said, um, a little, I would be cautious using the site with students, um, unless, you know, you um, had a controlled environment, or maybe you created their own um, usernames and gave them to them and assigned them and put them into games with each other. Um, that might work, um, but I would just, you know, be careful, especially about, you know, sort of stranger danger and talking to people that you don't know online. Um, there is an app. I have not had a chance to play this because I do not have an Android device. Um, there used to be one for um, Apple iOS, but that is no longer um, available, so that's something that you might want to explore. I can't at um, attest to it. Another game that kind of has a similar sort of press your luck type of idea is Pass the Pigs. So, you know, again, this is not the only game that has this sort of, you know, gameplay involved. There are others and you can sort of take a look at games that you've played, you know, with your family or with friends or, or other folks um, sort of through a new lens um, once you start looking at things um, the way that I do. All right, so the next one up is called Act Your Wage. Act Your Wage is a game that is from um, Dave Ramsey. And so um, this one, um, very variable in the price, depending on where you get it from. Um, one thing to note on Amazon, if you were just to search for it, is not listed under games. It's listed as a book supplement, which really threw me off at first, um, but it is the game. Um, you want it, this one will take a little bit longer. Uh, at least that's my experience with it, and it plays best with two to four players. So um, because it is uh, comes from Dave Ramsey, it does follow his seven baby steps, in particular steps one and two, which is to save um, in a starter emergency fund and then pay off all of your debt using the debt snowball. So um, when you play, you this is the, the game board so each person has a side of the board they're going to sit at um so if i was for example the red player i would sit this way in this food utilities mortgage rent um, emergency savings and savings are all like the envelope system of budgeting and so the game starts out everybody draws a life card it tells you what your job is the salary your status, um, what your paycheck will end up being, which is um, on this board, by the way, one month or one whole full loop around is one month. So you get paid twice um, a month. 
every you know two weeks basically and you pay different bills um, uh, halfway between each so um, you don't pay all of your bills at once you would pay your utilities um, one time and your um, rent or mortgage the other um, but you do have to pay for food um, both times which is pretty realistic most of us don't or at least um, maybe prior to everything that's going on, most of us didn't uh, you know, shop once or twice, you know, once a month, we would do it you know, more often. So um, that is you know, reflective of, of the real world. Um, and then everybody gets three debt cards. Um, and so uh, the way that the game teaches you to, to strategize about this is that you use the debt snowball approach, putting the smallest debt amount first so that you, sort of build up that momentum. There is no discussion about the interest rates um, on these, which you know, is sort of a, a, whole nother, um, a whole nother piece. So uh, you get to start, you get $1,000 plus whatever your paycheck is. You allocate that to the different envelopes, if you will. And then the game starts with everybody taking turns and making their way around. In some cases, you get something specific, like add $1,000 to your emergency fund, which means that now you have to have $2,000 in it. Um, you, um, this one, kids left the lights on. If you're a parent, pay one month utilities. Okay, well, in this case, I'm a teacher with one kid. So now if I land on that, I have to pay an extra month's worth of utilities. So it varies, and then you can also land on these ones for give, Dave says, save, um, and spend. So let's take a look at what some of these types of cards are. Now this is where, like in all games, you need to play it first and you really need to scrutinize it, okay? So there are some cards in here that I personally would probably take a little bit of issue with, and if I were playing them um, in a classroom, I would probably remove them. Um, this is you know subject to your own individual interpretation. So for example, I personally have a little bit of, so give cards, let me just back up, give cards, you give the amount of money on the card to each player that you're playing with. So if I had to give $200 and I was playing with three other people, that's gonna cost me $600. Um, I have a little bit of this issue that this notion of buying disability insurance um, should be given to other people. I kind of feel like that's um, a spend card, but you know, that's just me. Um, the save card, um, take issue with a few of these just by virtue of the fact that they're very sort of explicitly um, branded. So your Dave Ramsey endorsed local provider finds a better deal or you attend Financial Peace University as opposed to you attend a financial education seminar um, and learn about savings. So you know review all of these see if any of them you know give you pause or are going to end up you know resulting in a call to your administrator that you need to justify um, you know, and use your your best judgment. Um, same thing on some of these spend ones. On the spend ones, I find these to be a bit value laden um, in terms of um, really aligning with Dave Ramsey's approach. He's very clear about how he, you know, what he believes in particular about credit. And if you don't align with that or espouse those same, you know, thoughts um, or you have concerns, you know, you want to critically address some of those, um, some of those uh, cards. Um, I don't think anybody's going to take issue, though, with Fluffy the kitty making an unexpected trip to the vet. So, um, again, definitely something you want to take a look at. Uh, there are different cards in both Spend and uh, Dave Says that are called the Stupid Tax. These are cards that if you draw them, you actually give them to another player, and it adds to their total debt, depending on your students, if they would not be able to handle that. You know, giving that to somebody else, maybe you've got kids that don't get along or are going to pick on somebody, I don't know you could choose maybe to, to just eliminate that um, component of the game. And then finally, these yellow cards, Dave says, a lot of this is, you know, again, I'm going to tie to, to what um, Dave Ramsey believes. So, you know, again, you, you know, just take them with a grain of salt, figure out which ones that you're comfortable including, um, and remove any extras. Along those lines, quite a few of these um, do include, um, references to Bible verses. So if you're teaching in a public school, you know, you, you need to take the temperature on that and decide whether or not those are ones that you need to pull. So, um, you know, some of you are teaching in, in private, there are, you know, parochial schools um, where that might not be an issue, but um, just want to make sure that you're aware that those are there. All right, so as students are playing, you could have them keep track of financial terms that they encounter. 
Um, you could have them for each turn track their income, their expenses, and the balance in each of their uh, each envelope throughout the game. So different things that you could have them do. Afterwards, you know, questions, discussion about you know the income. Um, you know, were they able to pay? for their expenses, um, you know, this whole notion, one of the rules is that you have to fully fund your um, emergency savings before paying off debt. Do you think that's a good one or not? Um, you know, what new concepts did you encounter? And then again, similar kinds of things, you know, how could you improve this? So um, the complaint I've heard from some folks is, you know, there's no choices. So how could you change this up to account for choice in the game? Um, maybe have them play this in a couple of other games and compare and contrast them. So a variety of different things that you can, de can do. But again, I think this works well if you're talking about budgeting, if you're talking about charitable giving, if you're talking about paying down debt. Um, you know, this really incorporates a lot of different personal finance concepts. All right, Monopoly. This one is, you know, kind of a family favorite, right? We've all played Monopoly before. Um, I'm assuming at least that all of us have played Monopoly at some point or another. Chances are good if you have. Um, you probably have some feelings about it. Um, you might even have some really strong feelings about the new token lineup where we've got a big duck, we've got a dinosaur, we've got a kitty cat, all right? So, you know, I'm sure there's some people with some feelings about that. Long gone is the thimble. Um, I still have versions of the game with a thimble, but anyhow, um, new token lineup. But some of you might also have some pretty strong feelings about, you know, the game itself. Some people are like, oh no, not Monopoly, it's way too long. There's no real strategy involved. Other people are like, oh no, there's a ton of lessons to be learned. I think it's so much fun. Um, great comment from somebody, yes, used it in their accounting class to practice journalizing. Um, if you teach accounting, there are a bunch of different resources online to do exactly that. And I think it's, it's fantastic and awesome. Um, so in the terms of personal finance and that side, here are some lessons to be learned from Monopoly. Um, you know, you should always plan for the unexpected. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, it's always a good thing to diversify. Um, this whole notion of generating passive income, you know, that's something that we don't talk about a lot in personal finance, but, you know, basically the whole concept of monopoly is to, you know, own property and make money by having people land on it or, you know, in the real world that would be called renting it. Um, you know, life isn't fair. Sometimes you, you know, you get a chance card or you roll a poor, you know, roll. That's real life, right? Um, focus on cash flow. Think and plan about your purchases. Um, invest early and often. That's a pretty big strategy with Monopoly. If you don't get into the game pretty early, you can be kind of cut out. Um, it's always worth a try to negotiate and then you know, play for the long game, you know, practice some discipline, think ahead, what have you. So these are just some lessons to be learned. I think it would be interesting to, you know, have students play and then have them come up with some of these lessons. But this is just me trying to make the case for why Monopoly could um, be a good educational game. There are a ton of different versions out there, um, you know, lots of branded games like for the Avengers, a Fortnite version, which I think is hysterical because it uses V-Bucks instead of real money. Um, I have some Fortnite players in my house. Um, Unicorns versus Llama, there is even now a House Divided, which is a political version. I mean, there's like so many different versions of Monopoly, right? Um, I've seen this one in the store a number of times recently, Ms. Monopoly. I haven't bought it. I don't, I don't have it yet. I haven't played it, but supposedly this, in this one, women make more than men. So whole new take on Monopoly. Um, this one is Monopoly Speed. Um, they say you can play the game in under 10 minutes. Again, um, I don't have every version of Monopoly, so I apologize. I can't attest to all of them, but wanted to make you aware that all of these different versions do exist. By the way, one thing I think would be neat would be to have a variety of different versions and have students play different ones and compare them and contrast them, in particular with the ones I'm gonna to get to you in a second. So this one, Monopoly Ultimate Banking. Gone is the Monopoly money and the banker. You no longer have to have somebody that makes change for everybody. Hmm, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I think that would be a really interesting thing for students to do, play Monopoly with real money, play the not Monopoly this way. So in this case, bank part cards replace cash. The unit scans the property cards and boosts um, or crashes accordingly. So let's take a look at this. 
Hi, I'm Laurie from TTPM, and this is Monopoly Ultimate Banking from Hasbro. This is a fast action Monopoly game where players make instant transactions by tapping their card on the battery operated Ultimate Banking unit after purchasing properties or charging players visitor rent fees. The game basically plays the same way in that you move around the game board, buy properties, pay rent to other players, and try not to go bankrupt. However, some aspects of the game are different. First, there's no cash in the game. The Ultimate Banking Unit does everything for you quickly and easily. Just tap your bank cards, title deed cards, or event cards to the unit. You also don't have to wait to own a color set in order to put down a house. And every property has a title deed card that shows five rent values. Every time someone lands on a space you own, they pay you rent, and your rent jumps up one level. The game board is also different. It still has property names from the classic Monopoly, but there are no chance or community chest cards. Instead, there are event and location spaces. Event spaces mean that you take an event card, which can lower or raise rent levels, give or take money, or send you to jail. Location spaces allow you to pay and move to any property space, which you can then buy or raise the rent level on. Once one player goes bankrupt, the player with the most money and property wins the game. To play this game, you'll need three AAA batteries, which are not included. This is a pretty cool new way to play Monopoly that is much faster, and you don't have to worry about who's going to be the banker. Nobody ever wants to be the banker! The Ultimate Banking Unit keeps track of everything. This version still has some of the classic game elements from the original, but the updated features keep the game fresh and fast. Do we mention it's faster to play? This fast game is for two to four players ages eight and up. All right, so good example. There's another one called Monopoly Voice Banking. It's like, you know, the echo meets banking. So you speak into it and you tell it what, happen what happens. There's not like any cards or anything. It's just crazy. So anyhow, um, there are lots of different um, ways to play this now. Um, and I would encourage you to check them out. There's a junior version if you know folks that are younger. Um, and there's even a junior electronic banking where um, little kids can swipe a card instead of dealing with cash. So you can all have your own feelings about that um, and think about what you would like to, uh, to check out. Um, there's also this sort of, this one is actually technically not um, billed as a parody, I, I guess. I don't know. Um, there's some other ones I'm going to show you in a minute that are. This is Monopoly for Millennials. If you just feel like hanging out online tonight, um, check out what people think about this game. It's fascinating. There's a lot of strong opinions about it. Um, you collect experience, um, experiences as opposed to property. Um, got some new, uh, again, some, some different uh, characters here. Um, it's fascinating. Again, I've not played this one, um, but um, it'll be worth, worth checking out. Again, if you're going to play any of these, always check out the cards, make sure you're okay with them. Um, I do know some teachers who have played Monopoly Socialism. This one, is, again, is a parody, and this one is intended for adults. So again, um, buyer beware, review, make sure that everything, you know, you're okay with. But on this one, uh, when you pass go, everybody collects money from the bank. Players put money into a community fund. You know, this is, um, you know, a whole different version of this. So again, I think it'd be really fascinating to have people play different versions and, you know, compare and contrast or rotate through. Um, this one really is not basically playing Monopoly. It's like this little thing that you takes batteries and you, it's like a, um, like a money machine, like it blasts all the cards and money out. Um, but I could just see this being fun in the classroom. So I thought I would include it. Okay. Game of life. Last but not least. Um, so there's the traditional or the like newer version of the traditional game. Hey, it now adds pets to your life. So, you know, uh, not quite the game of yesteryear, but um, a new and improved version. And yes, Life 2 has an electronic banking edition. So uh, you can play Life with credit cards. Swipe the card, keep track of what you're doing. This one I wanted to mention, this one is only available at Target and is another parody version um, from Hasbro. Again, intended for adults. You've got to look at the cards. But this one is called the quarter life crisis. So again, this is sort of that you know, play on for individuals who are you know, in their mid twenties or what have you. Um, and I'm gonna skip over this video in the interest of time, but show you a couple of these, um, uh, these cards. So you get a, not only get a real job, quote unquote, but you get a side gig as well. 
you can see if you read here, the grandma's house one um, gives you an idea of some, some of the stuff that maybe you need to read through and decide if you're okay with um, students um, having in your class. Um, you have, you know, all sorts of different things. And again, I would read every single card and make sure you're okay with them, including how students interact with each other. So in some cases, there's these dares, like if you could save all but one player here from a gigantic spider, who would you sacrifice and why? Okay, maybe not a conversation we really want to have in class. So again, um, choose what you want to um, use in the classroom. I know a lot of teachers do use this and they just remove different cards. So um, you know, give it some consideration. And again, there is a junior version of life. There's even a marvelous uh, Mrs. Maisel edition of life. So, you know, like everything, there's all sorts of different versions. Last but not least, I wanted to just give a shout out to the idea of making versions of, making personal finance versions of some games that you already know and love. So I'm not going to go into how you play these games, um, but you can check them out on your own. Code names, I think, would be really cool, especially if, if you have some advanced or gifted learners um, to challenge them with making one, or you can make one and have your students play it headbands, which is very similar to heads up, where basically card on your head, um, you answer, or the other players answer yes and no questions, and you try and guess what it is they're talking about. So I could just imagine this with cards that say stocks, bonds, mutual funds, um, you know, all sorts of different things that you could think of, um, including for these cards. Scategories could be another possibility, Pictionary, Taboo, um, and or Danger Word, where basically trying to get somebody to guess something without saying the word. Um, and then finally, You Bet. I also think you could make an interesting version of this game as well. So, whew, I am just making it in the nick of time in our six and 60. So that was our six plus some bonus uh, discussion of games. I'm gonna stick around for a few minutes and ask any, um, answer any questions that any of you might have. Before we sign off, I wanna just let you know a couple of things. Um, we have office hours um, tomorrow and Thursday. So if anybody wants to hop on at 10 a.m., there is a link in the handout with where you can register for those sessions. If you register, you can attend either or both. Um, we will be talking and following up um, with anybody who joins um, and would like to talk about any of these board games and card games a little bit more, as well as a resource that I'm hoping you guys saw my email about, but just in case not, I wanted to make sure that you are aware that um, we put this resource out on the PDE Standards Align system, pdesas.org. There's a shortcut to this also in your handout. And if you go to this and go to Financial Literacy Resources, you will find this handy dandy PDF. It should download for you when you um, click on it. Um, it is organized by Big Idea. And with each of the big ideas, we've got some um, different assignments that you could be giving to students. Um, this is just a couple or several pages of these for each of the um, big ideas, as well as some other units that you can um, access to assign as you are um, you know, just shifted to remote learning and or are thinking about um, possibilities for next year, depending on what that might look like. I know lots of schools are, um, you know, trying to look at um, a variety of scenarios and making sure that they're prepared in either direction. So again, Tuesday and Thursday, uh, 10 a.m., uh, feel free to hop on to Zoom. That'll be a meeting format so we can all chat and say hello. Um, apologize, apologies to anybody for whom those times don't work, but um, if you're interested, I hope you can um, join us for those. All right, thank you so much for participating. Again, I will stay on for a few minutes to answer any questions um, that anybody has about any of the um, games or concepts that we talked about here on the webinar. 